I think my earliest memory of chocolate is my dad telling me off for eating too much chocolate. I first moved to London about 10 years ago from Leeds with the kind of sole objective of working in radio. I managed to get a job at the BBC and spent the next five or six years kind of floating around. While I was traveling on my own through Central America, I ended up working on a cocoa farm. And for the next two days, I was told by this very enthusiastic cocoa farmer everything I needed to know about cocoa and how it made chocolate. And I was kind of blown away by it all. The whole chocolate thing was never in the plan. It was just one of those things that happened by chance. As soon as I came back from that trip, things happened really quickly, and then it just became quite an obsessive thing that I wanted to do. Nothing was going to stop me. Cocoa or cacao only grows in tropical conditions. And it's this incredible fruit tree which catches your eye because it's such a bizarre looking thing. The pods themselves are all these different colours, and then you open up the pod and you realise it's fruit, and inside this seed, this is what makes chocolate. The biggest thing as well that kind of struck me was the cocoa farmer describing the different varieties of cocoa he had. And then you start to learn that genetics and DNA is also just as integral as anything else. When you start to scratch the surface, you realize you can showcase a whole different side to chocolate. Well, it's a question I get asked a lot is, why would I buy your bar of chocolate for £5.50 when I can get a bar of chocolate around the corner for 60p? It's important to think more about the question of why is that chocolate bar in the corner shop 60p and how much of that 60p is going back to a cocoa farmer. If you know they've got good quality cocoa beans and you, you want to work with them, then you can help them by obviously paying them a higher price, which is two, three, four times the price of even fair trade which means they can improve their facilities, which means they can improve their product. It's a two-way street. Without the farmers, we're not chocolate makers. And unfortunately, I think the importance of them have been lost along the way. If someone was interested in being a chocolate maker, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest it's a healthy lifestyle. I'm gonna use a phrase I'm not a big fan of, but it is a labor of love. It's not a very glamorous job. As much as people would love to think that it's exactly like trying a chocolate factory, it's so far removed, it's unbelievable. I think I actually learned the most about chocolate making in my house at night time, roasting my cocoa beans in my kitchen, annoying all my housemates because I was trying to make chocolate at two in the morning. I think you really have to embrace it. You have to strive to be the best at every point of the process, or I think you'll get caught out. I used to be quite scared of giving people my chocolate because I was like, what if they don't like it? But now I quite embrace it because I could have easily made a range of chocolate which was quite middle of the road, but I'd rather make something which made people question what they're eating in a, in a kind of positive way. I think the most common thing with chocolate is we put it straight in and it goes straight down, there's no messing around. Whereas with this chocolate, you have to treat it like you're tasting a wine. So when you're putting it in your mouth, you have to let it melt. In those short moments when it's in your mouth, suddenly you'll start to get these incredible flavours coming through. We've been so used to what we think chocolate has been, we're just scratching the surface, I think. Um.